Welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. If you're unfamiliar with Care Patrol, we're aging care navigators, meaning that we meet our clients where they are, whether that be in a hospital or rehab bed or in their living room or in a coffee shop, we help them understand what their needs are in terms of the next steps in their journey of health care. And we help them understand what providers are in the marketplace that they may want to use. And we do all of this at no charge, just like this CEU today. So we are folks who uh, want to advocate and guide and provide advice to those folks who may not know where to turn, even though they have wonderful providers like you all. And we hope that you will continue as you have been so generously referring clients to us who have a need. You know, only about 40% of the clients who are referred to us actually ever end up being paying clients uh, because we're paid by the providers of private pay placement, meaning in-home care or assisted living. And so, so many of our clients can't afford or don't qualify for those levels of care, and we help them in other ways. And one of the ways we like to help is education, not only to our clients, but to you. We're accredited by the Alabama Board of Nursing. We're also accredited by the Alabama Board of Social Work, and each of those awards 1.0 contact hour for today's teaching. In order to receive credit for attending today, you must do our evaluation and it is password protected. The reason we password protect our evaluation is that it allows us to say to the Alabama Board of Social Work that those of you who are here today and social workers are pursuing a live hour or a classroom hour and not a recorded presentation. That's why we do our evaluations the way we do. They're password protected, and we give the password at the end. But do let me go ahead and give you the link for the password. As I know those of, those of you who are uh, attending who are not able to see a screen, let me read for you now our evaluation link. It is HTTPS colon forward slash, forward slash, www.surveymonkey.com, forward slash, lowercase r, forward slash, all uppercase letters here, y, z as in zoo, two, h, m as in mary, F as in Frank, P as in Paul. That's our evaluation link for today's course. You must complete it in order to receive credit for today's hour. And hello to all of you who are saying hello. Thank you for being with us today. We're so grateful and gratified to welcome again Dr. Rebecca Sipma uh, from the UAB Neurology Department Movement Disorders Clinic, who will be sharing with us uh, more information about Alzheimer's dementia. Dr. Sipma is a returning presenter with us and has just graciously agreed to return in June with a new topic for us. And in the interim, as a testament to Dr. Sipma, she will be teaching in Kenya to physicians and other clinicians there on the topics of neurology, et cetera, and it's her uh, love of education that brings her to us and it marries well with our intent to educate others. And so without further ado now, and welcome to all of you who've just joined us, without further ado, I'll present to you Dr. Rebecca Sipma, and thank you again so much for being here. Thank you for having me back again. Again, I'm a huge proponent of education, uh, especially regarding neurology. And so I'm thankful that you guys are providing a platform to help educate, again, people who are caring for those or can have potentially have loved ones who are affected by these types of diseases. 
Uh, so like I said, we'll jump in today on Alzheimer's dementia. We hit, uh, if you were with us previously, I did kind of an overview of different types of dementia and we had a little bit on that, uh, but this is going to be going into a little bit more detail on some of those features in particular for this disease. So we're going to review some of the neuroanatomy and the pathology uh, specific to Alzheimer's dementia. We'll discuss some of the common symptoms. And then we'll highlight some of the available non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic treatments, including caregiver support and end-of-life care. So again, jumping in, we're going to hit some of the definitions first uh, before we jump into some of that. So cognitive changes. So first, whenever someone's coming to our clinic with complaints of you know memory changes or having trouble thinking or just general cognitive complaints, the first things we're gonna be looking for are treatable causes of cognitive changes. Those can be things like thyroid dysfunction, vitamin deficiencies, thiamine is particularly prevalent around here uh, for some reason, B12 deficiency is another big one. Um, Medications can very much have an impact on your sedation level if they're sleeping well or if they're just really foggy just due to a side effect of a medication. Recreational drugs and heavy metal exposures can also be a big thing where it's trying to tease out on history if we need to do further testing for those uh, infections such as syphilis, meningitis, encephalitis, again, have an effect on the brain and its environment, which can then for affect thinking and cognition. And then things like depression as well. So if you're just not having the motivation or the enjoyment of doing things like you did before, that can look very similar to a cognitive change or depression or to, or to dementia, but really it's all linked back to that depression. Once that's under control, then their thinking really clears up and uh, becomes much more coherent or back to baseline. Similarly, if you're not sleeping well, so people with OSA or insomnia, if they're not getting the adequate amount of sleep, you're not able to really cement the memories or the things you were learning earlier in that day. And so treating those conditions can really improve their thinking and processing. So then we get into mild cognitive impairment, which is a loss of memory greater than expected for age. And there are different testing norms, which we can compare that to. Uh, but it's not interfering with any of their independence. Compare that with dementia, where it's, you do have that loss of memory and other mental ability that is now severe enough to interfere with daily life. Dementia is a general term, again, referring to this interference with daily life based on mental uh, capabilities, but there are many different causes of dementia. The big one we're going to focus on is Alzheimer's disease, and that's what most people think of when talking about dementia, but there are lots of different things that can fall into that category. Um, so again, we're going to focus on Alzheimer's dementia, which is about 60 to 80% of the estimated dementias. There are some variants we'll hit on today too, like posterior cortical atrophy and primary progressive aphasia. But other things that are neurodegenerative that can cause dementias include dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and Huntington's disease. Similarly, you can have infections like HIV and creutzfeldt jakob disease, which can look like a dementia or have produce a type of dementia. And then vascular dementia, which is multiple strokes or small ischemic changes, creating those limitations in mental capabilities and alcohol-related dementia are some of the most common here in the United States. Um, and like I said, we previously done a little bit of a review of some of these other types, and I went into more detail on dementia with Lewy bodies previously, but today we're going to focus on Alzheimer's disease. So really going back to neuroanatomy, uh, the type of symptoms that patients have are going to vary depending on the areas of the brain most affected. So predominantly in Alzheimer's disease, your temporal parietal lobes are affected. So the temporal lobe is very important in memory. Parietal lobe is very important in awareness of disease and also calculations and a bunch of other um, different symptoms we'll kind of go through in more detail. There are different variants though as well. So some patients with more of a frontal lobe variant have more trouble with behavioral changes, which can be either more um, withdrawn into themselves and apathy, or it can be more disinhibition. That's maybe making inappropriate comments or saying things or doing things that they wouldn't normally do, very impulsive. Uh, and then planning is another big part of the frontal lobe. And so that's, again, keeping up with appointments or planning the next steps and what you're going to be doing kind of throughout the day. There can also be primary progressive aphasia variants, which is really focused on those language centers. And those are typically more, uh, there's a frontal uh, area, which is impacted in aphasia, as well as a kind of temporal parietal lobe area, which can also um, 
to be part of that aphasia. And so those are slightly different than your typical uh, classical Alzheimer's dementia. Again, just really based on where the abnormalities are occurring most. So when we are looking at neuroanatomy on scans, the big things we're usually going to be looking at is going to be an MRI. So that's a scan here on this top right-hand side. So a normal, healthy age match control is going to be looking like this left-hand picture versus Alzheimer's disease. We see some atrophy kind of generalized, but predominantly here in this hippocampi bilaterally. The hippocampus is very important in the registration and formation and encoding of new memories. Another scan that your provider might order for a patient that we're trying to figure out which type of dementia they have might be an FDG PET scan. So this is a labeled form of glucose, which then tracks the glucose levels and metabolism in different parts of the brain. So typically in Alzheimer's dementia, we're going to see decreased glucose metabolism and levels in the temporal and the parietal lobes, which you can see here is going to be uh, again, these red areas are where it's most affected on the top line here. Uh, compare that with dementia with the Lewy body, which is going to have more kind of diffuse. It's not particularly um, well localized. Frontotemporal dementia, very predominantly in these frontal lobes. You see that very large area of red in the uh, anterior sections there. Uh, and there are, again, frontotemporal dementias, which has more of a temporal predominant, which uh, is, again, kind of showing a, a similar temporal areas, uh, but compared to Alzheimer's disease, which is on the top, you don't have as much of that parietal lobe, which is this kind of upper portion here. Uh, so again, something that we might use for diagnostic purposes, if we're not 100% sure, just based on the symptoms that a patient is describing as to which type of dementia they may have. So going back to pathology now, so that's what's happening on the microscopic or cellular level. If we're cutting into the brain, what are we going to be seeing on slides? And those are going to be kind of two different proteins are predominantly uh, implicated in Alzheimer's dementia. The main one being beta amyloid plaques, which accumulate outside the neuron and interfere with signaling between the cells. And then there's tau. Tau accumulates within the neurons. And as you have cell death and kind of lysis of those cells, you get more tau released into the cerebrospinal fluid as well and the surrounding spaces. So these abnormal proteins lead to an inflammatory response as the microglia, which are normal cells within the brain, are trying to clear them. Uh, that's their normal job is to clear infections, clear abnormal proteins, but it can get to a point where they're overwhelmed and uh, it's that high levels of inflammation chronically can cause even more damage and kind of gets into the spiral of if you have abnormal proteins, you get more damage and then more damage causes more abnormal proteins. Uh, these pathologic uh, changes may start to be evident on slides if we're doing, you know, uh, autopsies of patients who died from other causes, those may be present decades before the symptoms even became evident. Um, so it's not uncommon for us to, you know, have a patient in a car accident. We're looking at the slides on uh, under the microscope uh, regarding their brain, and they do have a little bit of some of these changes, but again, they weren't necessarily having symptoms at the time of their death. So some of the ways that we will look for uh, both the amyloid and the tau is these different types of PET scans. And so these Again, PET is just looking at a marked um, binder of some sort, and so you can kind of target it depending on what you're looking for. And so we can have ones that are looking for amyloid, which is here on this left-hand side, which is showing a lot in, again, that temporal parietal region, and then the tau PET as well, again, red with high levels of tau, again, in that temporal region on this patient's scan. And similarly, they have decreased uh, uptake. So in this case, the blue is showing that decreased metabolism of an FDG PET, uh, which is similar to the slide before that we had looked at. So this is all just kind of comparison of different scans in, in Alzheimer's disease patients. Another way that we can test for these abnormal proteins is going to be a lumbar puncture where we're able to run assays and tests looking for these proteins on the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, there's some as well in blood that we'll look at, but usually CSF is going to be a little bit more accurate, again, because that's directly in the environment in which these cells are living. All right, and so then Alzheimer's disease is essentially on a continuum, right? So you have preclinical Alzheimer's disease where they don't have symptoms, but they may have those biologic changes, like we mentioned, the proteins starting to accumulate. And that progresses into the mild cognitive impairment where they might have some of the memory loss, but it's not interfering with their mobility or independence. 
And then dementia due to Alzheimer's disease is, is again, on the mild, moderate, and severe spectrum. And uh, mild is going to be interfering with some everyday activities, moderate with many everyday activities, and then severe is going to be really most everyday activities are impaired and they're needing assistance with those. So early onset Alzheimer's disease is going to be onset at younger than 65 years old. Those patients are more likely to have non amnestic or problems with modalities other than memory. Now, one in 10 of those patients have an autosomal dominant genetic predisposition, meaning one gene is really passed from you know parent to child and then to their child uh, it's in a 50-50 kind of ratio. You have the possibility of one gene being abnormal or the other gene being uh, regular, which is then passed on to your kids in a kind of a 50-50 uh, risk pattern. Uh, and then we'll get to some of those genes a little bit later here. And then these patients with the early onset do have a higher rate of traumatic brain injuries, and they tend to have less vascular disease compared to our patients with the late onset Alzheimer's disease. So generally talking about Alzheimer's disease, there's about 6.7 million people over 65 in the United States with it in uh, 2023. And then the Alzheimer's Association's data for Alabama estimates that in 2020, we had 96,000 people living with Alzheimer's disease. That's expected to increase by 2025 to 110,000, which is a 14.6% increase. Again, as our population ages, this is becoming a more and more prevalent disease and contributes a lot to the morbidity that people are living with. Again, sort of this... Uh, breakdown here. So 65 to 75, 75 to 80, and over 85. Uh, again, the as our population grows, we're getting more and more people over the age of 85, in which this is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, overall in the U.S., the predicted number of millions of people affected by 2060 are going to be, you know, 13.8 million. Uh, right now, we're close to, to that 2020, that 6.1 million people. I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. Sitma. Yeah. I have a question. It's yes fairly basic, but what did, do you think is the, the reason for a 14% increase over a five-year span? What is going on that it seems that more and more people are being diagnosed? The big thing that they're kind of attributing that to is going to be that baby boomer generation. We have a very a more of an aging population. Um, I guess. So that's going to be part of it. We also have better health overall. So you have more of a survival bias, right? So people aren't dying from the things that they used to be dying from earlier. Uh, okay. And so as that population overall survives heart attacks and survives cancers and survives other things, then you're at higher risk for these neurologic di diseases. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so current demographics, too, based on the Alzheimer's Association's available data, is about two-thirds of patients with Alzheimer's disease are women. Again, part of that might be due to survival bias. Women do live longer than men currently here, and so that might account for part of the reason why they are more likely to have dementia. And then the Black and Hispanic adults are disproportionately affected by Alzheimer's dementia, and that's not explained so far by the genetics we're aware of. So there are different factors, including structural racism, socioeconomic status, and environmental exposures, too, that are probably playing a role in these numbers that we're seeing. So the big risk factors are going to be age. Uh, another one is going to be genetics. Again, 31 known different genes at this point. And as we do more and more research on our genetics, we're finding additional genes which either are directly contributing or maybe, again, partially contributing to these statuses. Some of the main ones that we look for are ApoE4. Uh, it's one of the strongest genes that we know of for late onset Alzheimer's disease in white populations. There are fewer studies and inconsistent findings so far in other populations. Again, that's where again our research is trying to catch up uh, in that diversity, uh, kind of expanding our knowledge about other populations. And then trisomy 21. So the chromosome 21 contains the amyloid precursor protein gene, that APP gene. So patients who have three copies of that instead of the normal two, which again, that's what trisomy means is you have a third uh, chromosome 21, is going to lead to more production of this amyloid precursor protein, which then uh, converts into amyloid and then can uh, accumulate in beta amyloid plaques in these patients. And so that's going to be patients uh, who have Down syndrome. Their risk of developing dementia is going to be a lot earlier and it's a lot higher than age match controls.
We, we have a comment from Ariel Jones who said, I noticed an increase working in healthcare during COVID with elderly being isolated and not able to interact with people as much. And I, I think her point there is, is, or her question may be, is mm -hmm. this isolation somehow, you know, contributing to this? Yeah. And so one of that, those things too. So one of the big risk factors here on this next slide is critical illness in the elderly is being studied of like, okay, you go into an illness with a certain level of cognition and then the illness drops you down and then you may not be able to recover fully to that baseline. And then one of the protective factors that we'll get into is social and mental kind of stimulation is a protective risk factor, pr protective factor. Um, and so kind of the combination of higher critical illnesses and more social isolation are kind of working against each other or in combination to be at higher risk of dementias in general. So, um, so again, on that line, other risk factors here. So your midlife obesity, high blood pressure and high cholesterol are actually more important on your uh, risk factor, risks for dementia later in life, right? So they compared obesity later in life, not as much of an impact compared to this midlife when you are potentially having a lot of either protection to the brain or damage being done to the brain earlier in life. Smoking also increases the risk of dementia significantly and traumatic brain injuries. Um, some of it directly to Alzheimer's. There's other types of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathies, other types of abnormal proteins collecting to in all different types of traumatic brain injuries. So TBIs aren't necessarily going to be one versus the other, but in general, the higher risk of dementias. Uh, there's, again, ongoing studies on critical illness, sleep apnea, and air pollution as risk factors, too, for uh, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, Ms. Ward has a question, Sedina Ward. How does sleep apnea contribute to AD? And that's where the studies are still ongoing. And so I don't have all of the data in particular, but if your sleep is being disrupted with sleep apnea, you're not getting oxygen flow to the brain as consistently. So there is some damage going on to cells as well as just not getting the good quality sleep where you're encoding memories correctly either. Um, so that's kind of current understanding. But again, teasing out more of those details is where we're still doing some research. Okay, and then going back to things that kind of decrease your risk, things that you can implement now or encourage family members, uh, patients to start doing to help decrease your overall risk is going to be physical activity is one of the best things that we've got. And then heart healthy diet. So that is high in fruits and veggies, high in whole grains, chicken, fish, uh, nuts, legumes, and healthy fats. And a diet that is lower in red meats and lower in sugar is going to be more protective for the brain overall. And then there's higher education or mentally stimulated activities help build a cognitive reserve. And that really delays the development of symptoms. And so they haven't noticed that, you know, higher level of education prevents the accumulation of these proteins, but it's more of a, you have a higher starting point. And so you have a longer way to decrease before it's functionally impairs you essentially. And they, there is a portion of this too, where a higher education sets you up for a better socioeconomic status where you're not, uh, uh, having those envi same environmental exposures, you're avail able to afford a uh, more heart healthy diet too, because those things can get expensive. Um, and so it's multifactorial kind of in how it contributes to that cognitive reserve. All right, and then getting into different clinical symptoms. So memory loss is going to be, again, the hallmark, the main thing that you're seeing with these patients, especially if it's a later onset, so again, over age 65, Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, so really an early symptom in most of the patient, it really disrupts their daily life. This can be things for getting recently learned information. Uh, so that's where, again, they can recall 50, 60 years back, no problem, but what they had for breakfast or the appointment they scheduled last week are the things that they're not going to be remembering. This may show in the repeating the same question over and over, which can be frustrating to patients or caregivers, but really it's because they're, they're not encoding that information. So they have to really rely more on memory aids like phones or calendars or family members to help with some of the uh, compensation in that regard. Disexecutive function is the trouble planning and problem solving. So this might show up like missing bills, uh, trouble following recipes or instructions. They might start forgetting the rules to familiar games that they used to enjoy. 
Uh, this could also look like trouble concentrating and it takes a lot longer to complete tasks than it used to. As this disease progresses, they'll often need help with the multi-step tasks, so bathing, dressing, et cetera, because they can maybe complete one step, but they kind of get lost in the planning of what comes next or remembering what comes next. Losing things is also very common. This can uh, be part of difficulty in remembering where they were recently and can have more trouble retracing the steps as the disease progresses. Uh, they can also place things in unusual spots. And so it becomes a, okay, if we're looking for the keys, maybe they're in the freezer or the cupboard or someplace they wouldn't usually be. Um, this can lead to them accusing caregivers of stealing, uh, especially later in the course as they have behavioral changes that may come along with it too. Confusion with time or place is very easy for these patients to lose track of dates, seasons, or your passage of time. Uh, they can also forget where they are, or how they got there, which can be very, you know, uh, unsettling or disturbing for patients and can cause some anxiety or panic. Uh, early on, too, this might be, you know, getting lost when driving or navigating familiar places. They're reliant more on the GPS or even around the house. Can't remember where the bathroom is in the house and uh, can lead to issues and um, again complaints from family members of like, oh, they're, you know going to the bathroom in the kitchen, but it's more because they just couldn't remember how to get to the bathroom and had to go so urgently that they couldn't, again, retrace their steps or spend that time trying to find the bathroom. Visual spatial trouble can take many different forms. Uh, this in dementias is going to be unrelated to cataracts, macular degeneration, or other eye problems. So this is trouble judging distances, which you can imagine becomes a problem when they're driving, right? You know, not uh, stopping at the right distance and getting into accidents. Uh, difficulties with color and contrast and trouble reading can also be a, com a sign of dementia. Um, and they might have trouble manipulating objects. Uh, within this, too, there's a variant of Alzheimer's disease, which also has that same beta amyloid and tau abnormalities, but it more affects the posterior lobes, the occipital lobes, and the parietal lobes is where they have the majority of their atrophy and dysfunction. Uh, the occipital lobe is where your visual input is registered and synthesized and kind of connected with other tasks and everything. And so those patients with a PCA or posterior cortical atrophy might have optic ataxia, which is trouble coordinating the eye movements to look at the thing they're trying to focus on. And then simultagnosia is trouble putting those things together. So they can see pieces well and can understand maybe parts of what they're seeing, but they can't synthesize that information. For example, a patient might look at someone's face and be like, okay, I can see a nose or I can see an eyeball, but they won't register that it's a face or whose face it is. Or looking at a picture, they might be able to pick out like, okay, there's an umbrella there and there's a beach there, beach toy there, but they can't look at the overall picture and understand what's going on there. Um, so it can be very debilitating too, again, with the driving and loss of recognition of familiar people and places and uh, very devastating. Those ones tend to be more young in onset too, of like earlier, like 50, 60 uh, aged patients. And then language difficulties. So this can be trouble following or joining a conversation. They may stop in the middle of their thoughts or repeat themselves. They can also have trouble naming objects or using the wrong names. So again, this can be seen later in onset with the late onset Alzheimer's uh, disease, or there's a, another variant called the primary progressive aphasia variant, again, due to the same abnormal proteins, but affecting those speech centers before they affect some of the memory centers and other areas of the brain. Um, and so they have very early impairment in their communication skills, which can be very debilitating and again, distressing to patients. And then acalculia is the difficulty with written calculations. And this is another variant of early Alzheimer's dementia. Again, that less than age 65 might have more trouble with their parietal lobes. Uh, again, the parietal lobes are important for knowing which digit is which. So like knowing which one is your thumb versus which one is your ring finger. Uh, right, left disorientation as well. And so they might get things confused based on sides. And then agraphia is the, uh, they've lost the ability to write. So if they have all of those, that's considered a Gertzman syndrome, which is just one of our named syndromes with a bunch of different uh, problems with the parietal lobe. 
uh, patients with acalculia may also have ideomotor apraxia. And so that's trouble planning a movement or executing a movement. So they might have trouble mimicking something. Or if I say, can you show me how you, you know, brush your teeth? Rather than acting like they're holding a toothbrush and acting like they're brushing the teeth, they may use a finger and try to like rub the tooth. Or same with brushing hair, they might just try to use the fingers to like act like a comb rather than mimicking that they're holding a tool or an object. Uh, parietal lobe is also important with reading and writing. And so alexia is the trouble with reading and agraphia is the trouble with writing. So again, just based on which lobe is predominantly affected, these patients might have more of those difficulties compared to the memory, especially if they're early onset when this happens. And they may all come, again, with a late severe dementia. Most of these symptoms are going to be present. It's just a varying degree from patient to patient. And then changes to personality and behavior, again, can occur late in the disease, or they can have an early onset with a more of a frontal lobe variant. Um, and this can look different from patient to patient. So there are some who withdraw from social or work settings and give up hobbies they previously enjoyed. Others are more agitated, become easily upset. And there's others who become more suspicious, some depressed or anxious. Uh, and then very commonly we'll see sundowning, which is more of the, as the sun goes down early evenings is when patients get more and more confused. Again, part of this, like trouble with orienting to time and passage of seasons and time, uh, they become maybe more alert than they were and more agitated and trying to leave either the bed or the hospital or the house, uh, more prone to wandering or being unsure of where they're at and what's going on. All right, and then there are other changes as well. So incontinence happens almost fre more frequently in moderate and severe dementia. Uh, they can have repetitive or restless motor behavior. So picking at things repeatedly or moving, twitching, other sort of um, motor symptoms uh, that can be distressing more for family than others. Uh, severe dementia, they may become bed-bounded, imbalance, and trouble walking. When these patients are then bed bound, they have high risk for infections, bed sores, and blood clots, which can lead to hospitalizations and further complications and increase their risk of death. And then uh, as you're progressing as well, your brain is very important in coordinating swallowing. It's a very complex process. And so if you're not able to think through and swallow appropriately, then you start getting liquids and food into the lungs where you can get an aspiration pneumonia and wind up in the hospital or malnutrition where they're starting to lose a lot of weight or getting vitamin deficiencies, which can further exacerbate some of these cognitive issues with uh, because your brain is very reliant on these nutrients and these vitamins. All right, and then going into treatments. So first we're going to focus on some of the standards, which have been around for a long time. So acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are one of our mainstays of treatment. There are three different types, the denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. So denepazil only comes in a pill that's once per day. Uh, galantamine comes in either twice a day or an extended release once daily form. And then the rivastigmine is pills, which are taken twice a day, or it comes in a patch, which again, if you're developing swallowing problems can be beneficial of having a way that kind of bypasses that swallowing function. These ones are purely symptomatic. So there's less decline in, compared to placebo on cognitive and functional scales, and they may help with the depression and apathy uh, to some degree too. Uh, with certain types of dementias too, if you're having hallucinations, this can reduce a little bit of the hallucination side of it. Uh, they do have some GI side effects. And then the denepsil in particular, we try to take it in the morning because it can be activating where they have trouble sleeping at night or really vivid dreams is the other thing that some patients will notice with those. Mimantine is another uh, pill that we've got. This is usually more in the moderate uh, to severe dementias that we're using mimantine. The other ones can be used early uh, and kind of throughout the course. And this one works on a slightly different receptor, the NMDA receptor, and it antagonizes that one. Uh, so these ones, again, are purely symptomatic. Uh, they help with cognitive and functional scales, but they don't prevent any of the progression. And mementine has been shown to maybe improve some agitation, lability, and mood, and irritability. This one has side effects of constipation, dizziness, headache, and somnolence. Uh, so again, it's really 
uh, weighing the benefits versus the side effects if this is causing a lot more dizziness and headaches and not a great quality of life and it's really only helping a little bit with the cognitive uh, scales then again we might say it's maybe not worth it taking it at this point and then SSRIs or SNRIs are going to be our first line treatments for depression and anxiety in any of these patients they may also help reduce some of the agitation Again, side effects to watch for, sexual dysfunction, and then things like sedation and weight gain might be actually a bonus, right? So if we have a patient who's losing weight, if we can get them to increase their weight a little bit as a side effect of the medication, probably not the worst thing. Again, if they're having trouble sleeping, we can use it to our advantage at night where they're sundowning and we need them to be sleeping regularly. Um, if you have patients who are having depression and anxiety, Tricyclic antidepressants are another thing that we'll use in our younger population, but we really try to avoid these in the elderly or those with dementia because the anticholinergic side effects can worsen some of their uh, thinking in particular. And then there's dizziness and constipation and other side effects too that can cause issues. And then it's really going more based on individual patients. So what are the specific symptoms that are bothersome to the patient and or the caregiver caregivers that are impeding their quality of life? Uh, so if they have an aphasia, speech therapy early on and regularly is going to be really important for working on communication modalities that they can use. If they have a lot of the visual spatial deficits from the uh, either the progressing dementia or the uh, posterior cortical atrophy, then there are resources for the partially sighted. So I know there's the um, vision impaired clinic. I think it's over at the VA in Birmingham is the main one that we might refer patients over to. If they're having trouble sleeping, again, if you're not sleeping well, you're not going to be consolidating memories, you're not going to be functioning at your best. And so we really want our patients to be getting at least that six to eight hours of sleep. So again, melatonin or other things to help just knock them out for the night can be very helpful. Uh, again, for behaviors, we want to try non-pharmacologic measures, distracting them, changing the topic, uh, kind of bringing in something they enjoy doing to kind of get them off of whatever is uh, agitating them. Uh, the other warnings here too. So oftentimes in other conditions, like if they're agitated in the hospital, be like, okay, give a dose of Haldol or um, some Seroquel. Those medications do have black box warnings due to increased morbidity and mortality in dementia patients. So we do try to avoid those drugs if at all possible. Again, there's some cases where those symptoms are so severe that not treating them also increases this patient's risk of death. And so then it's weighing with the family of like, okay, which is more dangerous for this patient and what should we be kind of focusing on? And then again, if it's an early onset patient who's less than 65 and developing dementia, you want to take a family history and then think about talking to the genetic counselor. Um, again, right now, a lot of these genes don't necessarily have drugs or interventions or things that we can change, uh, but sometimes knowing status might be helpful for a family member, of like really honing in on exercise or quitting smoking or other things. But again, the risks, benefits need to be discussed with a genetic counselor so they can really understand um, the implications of a genetic test before they're going to start uh, down that road. Uh, also, our early onset patients, these are people who are in the middle of their careers and are uh, really dealing with the loss of function. Uh, our later onset Alzheimer patients might not be fully aware of their deficits, but some of these early onset ones who don't have as much parietal lobe involvement are fully aware that they're losing their ability to talk or to work or to see things appropriately. Uh, and that's very distressing. And so having people that they can talk to about those things is going to be very important for their uh, overall health and treatments too. All right, now getting into the newer anti-amyloid therapies. So there are now two approved here in the United States, uh, lecanemab and aducanemab, or lecimbi and aducanemab. Uh, so these are both humanized monoclonal antibodies that target beta amyloid plaques within the brain and help clear those out of the body. Uh, these come in IV infusions. The lecanemab is a set dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. The aducanemab has a titration schedule, so it's different doses, which uh, increase over those first seven infusions, and those are at least 21 days apart from each other. Uh, and then once you hit that seventh infusion, that's similarly that 10 milligram per kilogram weight, and then that continues kind of indefinitely until you stop therapy. 
So the effects that these medications have is they reduce the amyloid on both the PET scans as well as those biomarker studies where we're measuring those proteins in the plasma or the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid. And then clinically, this looks like a 30% reduction on decline on the cognitive dementia rating scale, some of boxes in the two trials that looked at aducanumab. And then for the lecanemab, it showed a 27% reduction in that same study over an 18-month period. And then lecanemab and their studies, they also looked at two other scales, uh, which looked at cognitive and functional decline. And those showed, uh, again, slower rate of decline in those things. Big thing here is they don't improve above their prior baseline, right? So we're not trying to start at this level and then get better. We're starting at this level and trying to maintain the same level of function for longer. And so that can be hard to be really hard to perceive a benefit, right? You're looking for things getting better, but really it's we're looking for things not getting worse. But how do you know what worse is if you haven't been there yet? Um, so kind of this equates to extending the mild cognitive impairment phase of Alzheimer's dementia by approximately 7.5 months. And they're estimating using some of these numbers that would extend the mild phase of the Alzheimer's dementia by about 2.5 years. So again, that can be meaningful of you're maybe not needing to get an extra caregiver or needing to go to a nursing home um, or able to function a little bit more independently for a little bit longer. But is that beneficial to everybody? Does everybody want that? That's where discussion comes in with the patient. And then we get into weighing those benefits versus the side effects. So anytime we have an infusion medication, there is a risk of an infusion reaction, uh, which again, might be very mild, needs a Benadryl, or it can be life-threatening and needing more emergent uh, evaluation. And then there's area, which is amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. And so that can look like just edema, which is going to be this picture A on the left-hand side is you have this T2 hyperintensity or bright space showing that there's swelling and inflammation in the brain, or it can look like bleeding. And that would be side B here, which has this darker spot, which is showing blood, uh, as well as this lighter space around here, which is also edema surrounding that. And so uh, there are a couple of things that can predispose patients to having one of these uh side effects, if they already have some of the vessel changes and a little bit more bleeding on their MRIs at baseline, this can be a higher risk. And then patients who have APOE4 gene test positive, uh, if they have either one copy or two copies, then they're at higher risk of one of these complications. Again, sometimes these were just, there's no symptoms associated with the inflammation. It's just found on imaging. Other times it can be, again, very problematic. And if it's a bleed, it could be even life-threatening. All right. And then that leads us into kind of end-of-life care and planning. So again, there's currently no cures. Again, there's these things that kind of slow progression, but it doesn't reverse it. Uh, and these are progressive diseases. So making sure patients and family are aware that, you know, they're going to need additional assistance with time that takes the form of managing finances and medications, driving themselves around, things like bathing, dressing, toileting too, as the disease progresses. Um, it's important to discuss end-of-life preferences with a loved one while they're articulate and able to voice those opinions early on. Because again, if you're waiting too long, they cannot make those preferences known uh, as the disease progresses. And then at age 80, about three quarters of people with Alzheimer's dementia are in nursing homes compared to 4% of their peers, right? So this is a big difference compared to people living without dementia. And then really there is a variable time course depending on the type of dementia and their comorbidities. So the more early onset ones tend to be more malignant or faster progressing versus other patients can live, you know, decades, almost a decade after their diagnosis with no, with uh, still a fairly good level of function. And again, other medical comorbidities, again, are they dying of heart attacks or lung problems or having other things that can contribute to their overall health status is important to be aware of. And uh, Ms. White has a question, which is how often is an MRI recommended for a dementia patient? So it's usually start part of our standard of care and working it up. Uh, and again, if they are, considering this medication, one of the IV infusions is absolutely necessary because we need to see if there's already some bleeding going on there. Um, but usually before they're even getting to a movement or a memory disorder specialist, they're looking at an MRI um, 
because again, we want to see if there's focal types of atrophy. It helps us figure out, is this Alzheimer's? Is this frontotemporal dementia? Is there a brain tumor that's going on that's mimicking a neurodegenerative process? Um, so almost everybody is getting an MRI early on in the course. And then again, if they're considering this medication, it's an absolute must. All right, thanks for that question. All right, and then part of planning for the future, future is going to be building a support team. So that's going to be counselors, friends, religious leaders, support groups, uh, knowing who the caregivers are going to potentially be. Is that going to be family? Is that friends? Are we going to hire some of those things out? Uh, then there's local resources, people who provide meals, respite care for caregivers where they can have a break to take care of their own needs. And it's important to know what those things are before they're needed even. And then talking with legal and financial experts early on, very important as well. Again, getting those pap that paperwork in order before it becomes too late. Uh, safety as well is going to be a big consideration, right? What home modifications are needed? Is the patient progressing to maybe eventually becoming bed bound? Do we need to widen doorways so we can fit a wheelchair through or prepare a space for a hospital bed, which can be lowered and raised so we can prevent some of the bed sores? Do we need to change the lighting so they're able to move around at night better? Medical alert services, if there's falls or they're uh, wandering or having other problems there. Driving evaluations can be done with occupational therapy, which are often helpful too when there's a disagreement between patient and family. Of like, patient is very adamant, I can do this, whereas the family is like, no, this is very dangerous. We need a objective third party telling us that, no, this is no longer safe. There's also wallet cards as well. So if a patient's wandering, having something on them where they're able to provide contact information for the family and, and doctor if they're out and, you know, located elsewhere. Um, and then again, kind of starting that conversation early as to when might a memory care facility might be a better fit than staying at home. Looking at caregiver support, about 83% of help provided to older adults in the U.S. comes from family members, friends, or other unpaid caregivers, and approximately half of that is for adults with dementia. In 2022, that was estimated to be 18 billion hours or about uh, $339.5 billion worth of informal assistance for patients with dementia. So that's a huge burden, as again, we talked about this becoming more and more prevalent. Caregivers are most likely going to be women, two thirds are white, and then a lot of them uh, live with a person in with dementia in the community. So again, at home rather than in a living, uh, a nursing facility. 60% of caregivers are married, and so they also have a loved one to be taken care of, and oftentimes they have kids as well. About a quarter of them have at least one child. And then... Uh, See, usually they also have fifty thousand uh, dollar annual household income or less. So again, trying to make do on a uh, relatively lower salary here too can be very very challenging, especially if you're having more than one parent or an in law uh, affected by dementia or other health problems. Um, and about thirty percent are age sixty five or older themselves. Right, so that could be another spouse who's caring for their loved one with dementia. Uh, and then let's see. And yeah, again, I'll sometimes a spouse here and then going into some of the other, uh, big things that are problems. So behavior changes can be particularly disruptive for the caregivers. Uh, and then with the loss of memories that also in, uh, induces a lot more emotional distress. So for the caregivers of patients with dementia, this spouse or this parent or loved one that you've had all of these other memories with, they're slowly losing those memories or that ability to recognize who you are compared to things like, you know, ALS where the patient is cognitively intact, they just physically can't move. They're still going to have all of those common memories they can share with you or try and talk about things and be very appreciative. You don't necessarily always have that with the dementia patients, which can be distressing. Um, and again, the caregivers report high to very high stress due to caregiving. Uh, again, physically is about 38% and emotionally about 59%. Um, and the caregivers themselves are also very likely to have depression, anxiety, cognitive problems, medical problems, and decrease in their own social networks as they're caring for a patient with dementia compared to those people who are caring for a uh, person with without dementia for some other medical problem. 
So big parts of caregiver support are having that multidisciplinary team. So plugging them in with primary care and neurology, the therapists who are able to help with some of these symptoms and social work who can then connect with other resources as well. Palliative care and hospice care teams can also be a very supportive uh, group in, if those are accessible to the team and the patients. Respite care is, again, giving that break where they can go to their own health uh, care appointments. That way they're addressing some of the depression or their medical problems to keep them healthy, to continue caregiving and being with their loved ones and enjoying life. Education, right? So making them aware of what does Alzheimer's early on look like? What are some of the things we're potentially facing? What are, again, the treatment options that are available to us? Support groups, the Alzheimer's Association has got a number of different ways to look those up locally to get involved. Again, with Zoom, that's become more accessible too. If you don't necessarily need to go in person, you can, again, stay at home with the person you're caring for and still log into Zoom or have phone calls and chats. Counseling as well, again, a big part to keep them going in the long term here. And then what are things that they can do to help the patient enjoy daily life, right? So making lists of things that are still important to the patient and highlighting those things to do them as much as possible, maximizing time with loved ones, mementos, using music to can be very therapeutic, trying to find lists of favorite songs, uh, memory books with pictures and mementos can be helpful. Um, again, as long as they're not becoming distressing either to like the caregiver or the loved one uh, who's starting to forget that. So there might be a point when it's, okay, this is causing more distress and maybe we remove the questioning of who, uh, who's in the picture and replace it with maybe something else more nature related or uh, less uh, distressing to everybody. Exercise and time outdoors, whether that's, again, if they're wheelchair bound, you can wheel the wheelchair to a porch or someplace that's safe for them to be or opening windows during the daytime to help try and keep those day night cycles intact is very helpful. Gratitude is another practice that is highly recommended for both patients as well as caregivers. Uh, and so that kind of brings us to our summary here. So we went through a bunch of the definitions. We reviewed that it's really the beta amyloid and the tau really causing a lot of the problems in Alzheimer's dementia. They can have a range of different clinical symptoms based on which lobes of the brain are predominantly affected. And again, that varies from patient to patient and can look different based on their other co medical comorbidities. There are some symptomatic treatments available as well as infusions that reduce the beta amyloid in particular, which can slow the progression, but not reverse it. And then really that comes to planning with the patient and the caregiver, who is your support team? What are the things we can enjoy to help you get a good quality of life and set you up to be safe and as healthy as we can be in the long run as this disease is, you know, usually not super short. It's one of those things that can live with for a long period of time. So uh, again, a lot of this comes from the Alzheimer's Association. There's a couple other articles here that I referenced as well. And then Continuum is a, a resource we as neurologists use frequently, which has up-to-date reviews. And I'm happy to field any more questions that you have at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Sitma. I know that we must have questions. We have quite a few people here today, 180. And now is your opportunity to ask whatever you might be thinking about Alzheimer's disease that you've approached in your practice. Um, I'm happy to unmute you uh, if you'd like to add your voice to Dr. Sipman. I know she'd love to hear your questions. Uh, we have very many comments coming through. Thank you. That was really good info. Great information presented. Thank you, Dr. Sipma. So informative and helpful. Glad to work with you. Great presentation. I learned so much. Let me read for y'all uh, now that we've come to the end of the hour. I'm going to read for you one more time our survey link, which you must complete in order to receive credit. And that link is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash, all uppercase letters, Y, Z as in zoo, two, H, M as in Mary, F as in Frank, P as in Paul, 
And I am placing this in the chat. And our password today, for those of you who need it, is ministry. And I chose that because education is a ministry of Dr. Sipma, who lives and walks her faith by training physicians and clinicians all around the world. She spent uh, time last year in Cuba. She's heading to Kenya uh, this summer or this spring, rather. And here's a question. There was a question that got lost. Is there a psychotherapy that is effective for AD, Dr. Sipma? So cognitive behavioral therapy is generally the ones that we will use for depression and anxiety. Um, but part of the problem with dementia and Alzheimer's specifically is you're already having dysfunction within the neurons. And so part of psychotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy is trying to rewire circuitry uh, through that thought processes and other things. And so it's hard to really get patients to participate in some of these and to have meaningful uh, outcomes with that. Um, one of the other things, so refractory depression, sometimes we'll use uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation too, uh, but that's very rare still that we don't need to get to the point of using those therapies. We have another question. Do you know of any allergy medications that may cause dementia? I was told Benadryl. So there's increasing evidence that long-term use of Benadryl and other sedating medications uh, can have an impact on cognition. Um, again, the exact mechanisms of that, uh, I'm not sure that it's exactly increasing the abnormal proteins like the amyloid and the tau, but it can decrease some of that cognitive reserve and have trouble with your processing abilities. And so we really try to avoid regular use of Benadryl these days. Um, and that's where a lot of these drug studies too, is like we study them in the short term and then we don't know about a lot of the long, long-term effects until we've been seeing them used consistently for decades. And so this is some of the thing that's coming to light, you know, after years of consistent use of it. Um, again, it's important to why we kind of keep track of these sorts of things too. Because like, again, these studies with these new Alzheimer's drugs, we have 18 months of data. We don't have long-term uh, outlooks. And so that's why there's some predictions on hopefully it'll look this way in a couple of years, but we need to keep studying them as we have more patients on them to get a full understanding of the implications and how they affect the body in the long-term. Fascinating. Another question, what are some ways to treat previously mentioned causes of cognitive changes? Example, vitamin deficiency, thyroid dysfunction, heavy metal exposure. Yeah. So again, we'll check labs to see if there's something that's reversible and treatable. So if they have a B12 dysfunction or thiamine dysfunction, we give them pills to supplement those deficiencies. Uh, if they have a heavy metal uh intoxication or exposure, it's trying to identify what's the source of that and stop it. So again, there's intentional poisoning where you have a spouse giving them something with arsenic in it or other heavy metals, or you have a work exposure where you're getting exposed to this. We're trying to stop that exposure and give your body time to get rid of it as best it can. Or if there is a chelating agent, meaning there's a medication we can give, which pulls that metal out of the body, we'll try that depending on what type it is. Uh, thyroid dysfunction would be like your hypo or hyperthyroid. And so giving the appropriate medication to treat that dysfunction would be the appropriate treatment. Another uh, comment, you mentioned smoking increases dementia, smoking cigarettes or smoking anything? Uh, a little bit of both, uh, really anything. Cigarette smoking is again, the one we have the most data on. Vaping is new and um, it's not as well studied, but again, there's lots of chemicals that are not good for the brain and so likely not helpful. Marijuana similarly can have cognitive impacts uh, for patients with long-term use. And so again, we'll sometimes use it in the short term, but not always a good option long-term. Thank you so much. We're at the end of the hour. Uh, oh, here's what about Mintona long-term usage? Uh, let's see. Mintona. I'm not a hundred percent sure about Mintona. Um, so if it is, there's a number of different supplements that are kind of listed as, you know, brain healthy or useful. None of the supplements that are on the market for those have 
really got great uh, solid evidence for them in the randomized control trials that they have, if they have any of those trials. A lot of the marketing is really based on the, we think this will be helpful, we think this will be good, but there's not a whole lot of data supporting supplements. Um, any thoughts on the overdiagnosis of dementia? And for those of you having trouble with the password, remember to capitalize the M in ministry. Uh, so again, I think dementia is becoming more re recognized. Um, there's probably a little bit more to mild cognitive impairment that people lump in with dementia. And so kind of having that, is it interfering or not, is important in our kind of medical mm -hmm. categorization of it. Um, Getting it diagnosed as it open doors to some resources. The bigger area we're running into trouble with here is get providing access to neurologists because there's only certain numbers who are memory disorder specialists and getting patients these IV infusions is a lot of logistics and a lot of um, prep work. And so um, we have at least in our clinic, we don't run into too much of the overdiagnosis. It is more of a, we're recognizing it and we're diagnosing it, whether we're getting the right cause of it is sometimes hard because again, there's a lot of overlap between which protein is the abnormal one or uh, which other medical things are contributing to it. Uh, again, I would be most concerned about the overdiagnosis in the sense of they're not looking for the other things that are potentially reversible, right? We're not looking for the sleep disorder, which is contributing. We're not looking for the depression, which is really causing their apathy and creating uh, a lot of co other cognitive problems kind of going forward. Thank you so much uh, again. And y'all uh, join us on Monday of next week. We'll have social determinants of health. Thank you again for being here today, Dr. Sitma, and for all that you do. Do you have any last words? Yeah, thank you for having me. I hope you guys uh, picked out something here useful for you and your patients and or family members. And again, looking forward to joining you in the future. Thank you. And thank you for all you do for others and educating them and for all the work that you do for, for, for helping clients who need your help. Thank you all for being with us today. Join us Monday and uh, have a great week.